Hello, Gen Chem 2 students. So um, I wanted to go through an example calculation for you on the hydrolysis lab. Um, so you each made one salt based on your pre-lab calculations. Um, the example I have picked is potassium. Um, let's see which two hydrogens phosphate, okay? So this particular sample, we talked about this part in class, if you're in my um, fall 2024 Gen Chem 2 class, but the process is always the same. We're gonna ionize anything that's ionic. Oh, I'm not supposed to say four, hold on. Um, so I took a positive K away from this, which means that H2PO4 must have a one minus charge. So that's our first step every single time is to ionize the alternative name for that is writing the dissociation reaction. It means the same thing in this context. So that's the first step. Then I'll take each ion and react them with water. So we call this hydrolysis. I usually start with the positive ion, but it doesn't actually matter. I don't fill in what kind of arrow this is because I don't want to um, be confused later. So I usually just use kind of a question mark or leave it blank. And the question I'm always asking myself is would the substance reacting, in this case, K plus, rather react with H plus or OH minus in the water. Those are the two species that are involved in hydrolysis. We're never gonna have just O by itself. So it's always H plus or OH minus. And this is really just thinking about charges, right? So K plus is positive, which means it won't want to react with the H plus. So the possible product here would be KOH, and that would leave behind the H plus in the water. So hydrolysis means breaking apart water. In this case, H plus is produced by breaking up the water and then KOH. Now, the question to ask yourself when you get to this phase is, is this product strong or weak? And hopefully by now you've memorized the strong acids and strong bases, and you know that KOH is strong. If that's true, then this reaction never happened at all, because if it does, this means no reaction. If it does happen, um, the KOH is just gonna ionize again since it's strong, and we're gonna get back to K plus, and we'll have an OH minus. OH minus and H plus are just gonna recombine and make water again. So that reaction has no impact on pH. So our second step was the cation hydrolysis. Our third step is gonna be doing the same thing with the negatively charged particle from our dissociation. So in this case, that's gonna be H2PO4 minus. So, that's gonna react with water. And actually, as it turns out, there's two different ways this can react with water because it's amphoteric. It can act like an acid or a base. So H2PO4 minus could act as an acid, in which case it's going to donate one of those H's, not both of them. We go one step at a time. But if it donates one of those H, that means we are losing a positive charge. So now it's going to be a two minus product. And that means our other product would be H3O plus because the H from H2PO4 minus was donated. That is an acid. If we produce H3O plus or H plus, okay, because the anion reacted with water, that means that our sample would be acidic if that's what happens. Okay. That means there's a Ka. And there is, in fact, a Ka. 
we'll look at the appendix for our textbook in a moment. Another option is H2PO4 minus might actually act like a base. Um, I'm gonna leave a blank one so we can figure this out. I sort of skipped that with this one. Um, HPO4 minus two is not strong. It's not one of our six strong. So that means this reaction is an equilibrium and it does occur and it does influence pH. Okay, so if H2PO4 were, were to act like a base, that means it's going to take the H plus away from the water, which kind of makes some sense because it's negatively charged. If it did that, now it would have three hydrogens and it would be neutral. That's called phosphoric acid. It leaves behind OH minus. Okay, that phosphoric acid is not a strong acid, so therefore this will be an equilibrium and it could occur. In that case, since it makes OH minus, that means it's basic. It's gonna have a KB. Now, it's a little bit tricky to figure out whether this chemical is going to be more acidic or more basic. It's, it's almost never gonna be neutral when H2PO4 minus or anything similarly amphoteric reacts. So let's keep that in mind. We always need to compare a Ka and a Kb to each other. So I'm gonna pull up the textbook so we can figure out which reaction would apply here. Okay, so here is um, our textbook. This is what the physical book looks like. The online book doesn't write the reactions quite as nicely. So I kind of like this version um, a little bit better. But so when we're looking at phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4, we see that that first reaction, the first, so this is Ka1, is where we're losing the first proton. So we go from H3PO4 to H2PO4 minus. So that's the chemical we were just interested in. Um, here it is again as a reactant. So H2PO4 minus can act as an acid to produce HPO4 two minus, okay? And so, And so if we're looking for H2PO4 in combination with H3PO4, so those are the two conjugates here, then um, so H2PO4, H3PO4, we said that was going to be a Kb. But if you looked in the base table, it's not going to list this. So we have to figure it out based on the value that we see for Ka1, because that's the one that has H3 and H2 in the same reaction. So going back to the appendix here. So we can see the H3PO4 in with the conjugate H2PO4 minus is Ka1. If I want to figure out what Kb1 is, what I need to do is use the relationship Kw over Ka equals the Kb I'm interested in. In other words, the reverse reaction of Ka1. So I'll take Kw is always 1 times 10 to the negative 14 when we're working at room temperature. And I'll take our Ka right here, and that's the denominator. That says times 10 to the negative three. So that's the calculation we need to do to get to Kb. So our answer for Kb ends up being 1.45 times 10 to the negative 12.
And again, that's our KB from our second reaction on the last uh, slide. Then just to keep track of it, what we need is So this KB is the 1.45 times 10 to the minus 12. And then KA is going to have HPO4 2 minus with H2PO4 minus. And since this is an acidic reaction, I should be able to find the H2PO4 as the reactant and the HPO4 minus as the product. OK, so. Zoom back in so we can see this better. So so the next one that has H two PO four as a reactant and H PO four minus as um, a product, which is what we wrote in our reaction is going to be Ka2. And I don't have to do any math for this one. I'm just going to use, use it how it is. OK, so in this case, our Ka2 is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 8. OK, so that gives us a value of 6.4. times 10 to the minus 8. So our Ka and Kb are relatively small, but we can determine whether this amphoteric material is going to act like an acid or a base by comparing Ka and Kb. Oh gosh, I just noticed we have two captions going. Sorry, that's confusing. Okay, there we go. So anyway, um, when I compare Ka and Kb, I'm looking for which one is larger. So 10 to the negative 8 versus 10 to the negative 12 means that the Ka is definitely bigger by four orders of magnitude than Kb. That means that the first reaction where it's acting as an acid is the one that is dominant. It doesn't mean that the second one doesn't happen at all. It just means that it won't influence the pH nearly as much as the first reaction. So I want to think about H2PO4 minus being an acid. In that case, then my pH should go down when I measure. You know, it shouldn't be, it should go down compared to the pH of your water. All right, so that's the first part of the calculation, figuring out whether it's an acid or a base. You have to show this work on every one of the um, salts for the hydrolysis part of the experiment. Then to calculate the pH, we're going to need to do an ice table. Okay, so okay, so we're going to think about that Ka reaction where H2PO4 minus reacts with water at equilibrium to make HPO4 2 minus and hydronium ion. We found that the Ka from the appendix was 6.4 times 10. My fours always look funny on these whiteboard apps, but times 10 to the negative 8 is our Ka. Now that's going to be defined as the products of our hydrolysis reaction here. Hold on. Here we go, products over the reactant. Water does not participate because it's pure. 
Okay, so that means my initial conditions, in this case, we need to figure that out, um, but the initial conditions will apply to H2PO4 minus, and I have to calculate how much HPO4 two minus and hydronium ion are formed. So I looked in the data sheets for fall 2024 and I found the person who made the potassium dihydrogen phosphate wrote down, actually two people made this one, so, but one of the people <laughs> wrote down 3.4325 grams. That is the correct number of significant digits because it should be measured on the analytical balances in the instrument room. Um, and it's pretty close to the answer for the pre-lab question as well. Um, everybody is supposed to write down the entire mass that was measured for each of the hydrolysis samples. So if you did not do that, you're gonna need to collect data from the students. Um, that you share a lab with, make sure you have all the significant figures that they measured. Okay, so first we need um, molar mass. I'm hoping by this point you already know how to calculate that, so I'm not going to walk through step by step, but you can do it and then check your answer if you pause the video now. We get 136.0 Eight four grams per mole. So I'm going to use that to calculate more precisely how many moles we actually have in the sample. If you're not in fall of 2024, or you used a different sample from the the one I chose, then you want to use the actual mass that was measured there. So it was 0 0.084 grams, okay? That will give us the number of moles. And then of course, we need to account for the fact that we dissolve that into um, what? 250 milliliters, 250.00 milliliters actually. Now I'm not actually rounding here at all. Um, Two, five, two, two, three, four is one extra digit, but I'm keeping them all in my calculator. That's KH2PO4, okay? That many moles were put into our 250.00 milliliter volumetric. Um, so if I want it to get to molarity, I'm gonna have to convert that into liters without, um, losing any significant digits here because we measured this carefully. So we wanna make sure that is shown in our work. This is kind of in the wrong spot here. Let me see if we can pull it back. Here we go. So that many moles were dissolved into 0 0.25000 liters. That volume is the same for everybody. Um, and so our final molarity here to the right number of significant digits will be, let's see, we get five sig figs. That's three, four, five moles per liter. So that's how much H2PO4 minus we have. Okay. That's about the H2PO4 minus. In the beginning, we had no, we don't care about water at all, ever, but in the beginning, we'll assume no HPO4 minus two and no H3O plus had been produced from this reaction. So that means the change is going to be minus the reactant plus the product. We don't have any coefficients, so it's just X. 
And so at equilibrium, we have our initial minus the change there and also plus x because zero plus anything is itself, right? So now I can plug it into the value we have here for Ka. So Ka, we defined it, or we found the value to be 6.7 times 10 to the negative 8. We defined it as HPO4 2 minus on the top, so that's x times H3O plus, which is the other x, divided by H2PO4, which we said was 0 0.10089 minus x. Now, we could solve this equation with the quadratic, or we can use the simplifying assumption. The k is very small here, so I am going to use the simplifying assumption and assume it's going to be a very small value of x so that our equation gets down to this. Now, none of this is new. We've done ice tables before. That was chapter 14 initially. We know what an acid is and the reaction is provided right in the appendix five. So hopefully none of this is like a shock when you, when you see me do this video. Um, don't forget, you've got to use the square root function here because it's x squared on the numerator. Okay, so in the end, you end up doing 6.7 times 10 to the negative 8 multiplied by 0 0.10089. That whole thing needs to be square rooted, and it's going to give us our H3O plus because that's how we had defined, defined our Ka up here. So X is H3O plus. So that's handy. Okay. So uh, the final answer for X is 8 point. Now let's see. Technically our Ka only has two sig figs, but that's a reference value. So I'm just gonna use the measurement here to determine my significant digits. So I'm gonna keep five, 8.2217. And that's a molarity, okay? So that's our concentration of H3O plus. So the very last step is if I need to know the pH, I take, the concentration of H3O plus, and I put it into the negative log equation to get to pH. So the negative log of that is a pH of 4.5. 085 is what it says, but we're supposed to round to two decimals, so we'll do 0 0.09. That should be fairly close to the value. It's a 0 0.9, 0 0.09. That should be very close to the value that you measure in the lab. It's possible not to match exactly, but the pattern should still be there. So if you follow this process for all of the salts, you should be able to put them in order from lowest pH to highest. And the pattern there that you calculate should match the pattern of what you measured in the lab. If it doesn't match, you want to talk about error analysis. If the pHs are also just far off, even when the trend matches, you want to discuss why that might happen. So this is how you do the calculations for the lab. Hopefully it's helpful. Have a good day.